I think it's the defining civil rights issue of our time. This is an area where our government discriminates against its own citizens. Leading trial lawyer David Boys is fighting to bring marriage equality to every state. It's a battle that Boys says is akin to the black civil rights movement. In the, in the 60s, you had uh, businesses saying, we don't want to serve African Americans. Boys, along with lawyer Ted Olson, took on California's Proposition 8 ban on same-sex marriage. The two friends were also adversaries on another landmark U.S. Supreme Court case, Bush versus Gore. The leader of the free world was at stake. The high-powered litigator also reflects on a personal struggle. What it demonstrates is that dyslexia is not a disability, it's a difference. I talked to David Boyes recently in New York. David Boyes, welcome. Why did you get involved in the issue of gay marriage? I think it's the defining civil rights issue of our time. This is the one area, has been the one area in this country in which not only do we discriminate against people, and there's a lot of discrimination that still goes on on a social basis, but this is an area where our government discriminates against its own citizens. And as the last essential official bastion of discrimination, governmental discrimination, I think both Ted Olson and I thought it was particularly important that we try to bring an end to that. They called you the odd couple. Yes. <laughs> how, how, did, how did this come about? Well, although Ted and I are quite opposed in a lot of respects in terms of our, yeah. our politics, and we were obviously against each other in Bush v. Gore, uh, we are good friends. Uh, we both always have, I think, respected each other. We looked for a case to work on together, and this was just the perfect case because not only was it an opportunity to work on something that was important, but it was an opportunity to work together to try to bring this country farther along on the path to equality. You had some reservations, right? Well, I had some reservations about the case because of the opposition to the case by people in the gay and lesbian community who had worked on these issues for a long time. They said it was too soon. They said it was too far, it was too soon, we endangered uh, the gains that they had made. And because they had devoted so much, and they knew so much about this area, that was counsel that would obviously give me concern. What's it, what's it like to be in a high-profile case like this, especially gay marriage, which is, I mean, you've probably been in the two most divisive cases in our country's history, uh, Bush v. Gore, and gay marriage has been the issue that, that has divided the country for years. Well, if I hadn't been a lawyer, I would have been a high school American history teacher like my father was. And so in one respect, it's a privilege just to be at the scene and see history, history being made. Uh, but in addition, I think one of the great things about a lawyer, about being a lawyer, is that you have a chance to fight for justice. I think on this case, on the gay marriage and the marriage equality issue, both of us believe that this was a critical issue for our justice system, that this was a critical step for this country to take in order to assure that everybody, regardless of race, religion, national orient, sexual orientation, or any other distinguishing characteristic, was an equal citizen in front of the law. Why did you call the book uh, Redeeming the Dream? The dream really was the dream of equality. And uh, that dream was realized in California um, in 2008, when the California Supreme Court held that all citizens of California were entitled to marriage equality. And then that dream was taken away in Proposition 8. And so this was, in a sense, a redeeming of that dream. It was also um, redeeming the dream of equality. That Martin Luther King's Martin, dream? That Martin, Martin Luther King uh, so famously spoke about. You think there's a direct line between the civil rights movement and the movement for, for gay rights? I do. I, I think there's a direct line. It's, it's not necessarily a straight line, but I think, it's a, I think there's a direct line from the struggle of equality that this country has gone through over the last 150 years. It's involved race, it's involved gender, it involves sexual orientation, it's involved religion, it's involved national origin. Uh, we have moved increasingly in this country towards the dream of equality. Our founders had great principles 
um, the idea that all people were created equal, that they had certain unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was a revolutionary idea. It was a great, great principle. The problem was um, that in those days, it really didn't apply. They didn't really apply it. Uh, when our Constitution says, we the people of the United States, it really means we, white male property owners. And expanding the concept of who the we is and we the people has been the process this country's gone through. And I think that process is a direct line. Has this, has this effort moved faster through the courts than you thought it would? I don't think it's moved faster through the courts than I thought it would. But I think that it has moved in this country faster than any of us expected. Is public opinion driving the courts move? Well, I think that the courts affect public opinion, and I think sometimes public opinion affects the courts. But I think there are two different trains that are going down the track right now. One is the legal train, and the other is the train in the court of public opinion. And fortunately, I think both of those trains are going in the same direction, and they're both picking up speed. What's the legal issue here? What's the important legal issue here? The important legal issue is, does the state have the right to discriminate against certain of its citizens based on sexual orientation, where that discrimination serves no legitimate public purpose? That is, one of the things we set out to prove at the trial was that discriminating against people based on sexual orientation in terms of who could marry, seriously harmed them and seriously harmed the children that they were raising. And perhaps not surprisingly, even the defendant's experts agreed with that, because it's absolutely clear that when you deprive somebody of a right as fundamental as marriage, you fundamentally hurt them. You hurt them emotionally, you hurt them reputationally, you hurt their place in the community, you hurt them economically. And the same kind of damage is done to the children that they're raising. The second thing that we set out to prove was that depriving people of marriage equality couldn't help anybody. Didn't help heterosexual marriage, didn't help my marriage, the fact that my gay neighbor can't get married. And so there wasn't any legitimate public purpose. It was simply a product of discrimination. It was a product of a belief that people were different based on sexual orientation. And because that didn't serve any legitimate governmental interest, there was simply no governmental basis, no justification for discriminating based on who could get married and who couldn't get married. So the Loving versus Virginia case, how did that impact what sure. you were doing? Loving, of course, is the case in which the Supreme Court held in 1967 that Virginia's laws that banned interracial marriage were unconstitutional. And in that case, the court talks about how fundamental a right marriage is, and how marriage cannot be held back from certain people based on governmental discrimination. In that case, it was racial discrimination. Um, and it's interesting that it took the Supreme Court 13 years after Brown against Board of Education to get around to holding that bans on interracial marriage were just as discriminatory as bans on children going to the same schools. And I think that sort of says something about the importance of sexual relations and sex and marriage and all the related issues to us in this society. And so it was critical, we thought, in the area of sexual orientation, just as it was critical in the area of racial equality, to establish that everybody had the right to marry the person that they loved. You've watched these laws pop up in states across the country, you think there, and these are laws that essentially say on, on religious grounds that business owners don't have to serve same-sex right. couples, don't uh, have to allow them into their businesses. Do you think that's a direct result of what's going on in the courts regarding gay marriage? Well, I don't think it's a direct result of it. I think what it is is it reflects the same kind of discrimination that we're attacking in the courts uh, in the terms of marriage equality. Uh, just as um, in, the, in the 60s you had uh, businesses saying we don't want to serve African Americans, um, I, you have uh, always had establishments that didn't want to serve certain groups of people that people had discriminatory intent about, uh, whether it was based on race or religion or gender or sexual orientation. And I think you see that now. 
uh, I think that will end as well. Uh, just as it took a while to integrate the lunch counters of the South uh, in terms of racial equality, it may take a while to uh, be sure that all businesses are integrated uh, in terms of sexual orientation. But that is, a, that is something that's coming in this country. Do you think about the other side and where they come from on this issue? Sure, Have you, have you thought about it? Absolutely. And where do you think it comes from? Well, I think um, it comes from different uh, places. Um, I think with respect to some people, uh, they have a genuine and sincere religious belief that um, heterosexual marriage is the only marriage that God intended. Um, and that's a religious belief that they're entitled to have. And our First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees them the right to have that belief and the right to practice that belief in their church. But the same First Amendment to the Constitution also guarantees that they do not have the right to impose those religious beliefs on anybody else. So they can decide how they will live their lives, but they cannot and run their business? And not run their business. Because when you start running, a, just, just as, for example, an individual can believe in their hearts and in their religion that whites are superior to African Americans, but they do not have a right to run their business that way. Because when you engage in commerce, when you open up a business, you take on certain rights and responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is not to discriminate against customers. The court didn't decide the issue of gay marriage. The United States the Supreme United Court. United States Supreme Court did not. Did not. Did not has it. not yet. Not, did not directly. And this is going to come back before the court. It probably will. And you've got, uh, since um, that decision last June, uh, you have had numerous federal courts around the country in Ohio and Oklahoma and Texas and Virginia and Utah, all over the country, uh, faced with the question as to whether or not discrimination based on sexual orientation into who can marry is constitutional. Every one of the judges who have decided that case to this day has decided that the federal constitution forbids discrimination based on sexual orientation in terms of who can marry. Republican judges, Democratic judges, judges appointed by George W. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, um, George H.W. Bush, the judge, incidentally, who we had in our trial court was appointed by Ronald Reagan, the judge that first ruled that marriage equality was constitutionally required, was appointed by Ronald Reagan. So this is not a Republican or Democratic issue, a conservative or liberal issue. This is an issue of interpreting the Constitution. And judges are consistently now interpreting the Constitution to require marriage equality. When you say it like that, I, I almost wonder why this didn't happen 10 years ago. That is exactly what my children and grandchildren are asking me. Uh, what they're asking is, what's the issue? Why did it take so long? Why does anybody believe that people ought to be discriminated against based on sexual orientation? Why does anybody believe that you ought not to be able to marry the person that you love? Uh, it's only the people who have grown up in eras in which they didn't know people of different sexual orientations because the kind of discrimination that existed required people to hide their sexual orientation so much. Uh, those, are the, those, are the, those are the hearts and minds that we have to win. The young people who have grown up in a different era, the battle's over with respect to them. When you look back at the, the two big cases, Bush versus Gore and this case, um, how do you compare them in the impact yeah. that they have on this country? Yeah. Well, they each had a tremendous impact. Um, I think the marriage equality case has certainly affected awful lot of people's lives in very, very important ways. Um, uh, it's always hard with cases. I've got six children. It's hard for me to say which child is most important. And it's, it's, it's hard to say which, uh, which case is most important. But uh, I don't think there's ever been a case that I have been as satisfied with, as proud of, as the marriage equality litigation. 
I want to ask you more about Bush versus Gore yeah. when we come back. Sure. We're back with David Boyes. Um, until the gay marriage case, Bush versus Gore, the biggest case of your life? It was certainly one of the biggest. How did you get involved in that case? Uh, I was called uh, after the election um, uh, by Vice President Gore's team and asked to come down to uh, Tallahassee for, they said, a couple of days while we sorted this out. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't really get to sleep for the next 30 days as we went from court to court. Uh, went to the United, we went to the United States Supreme Court twice. Uh, we went to the um, Florida Supreme Court three or four times. Uh, all within a space of 30 days. Did you anticipate that it would take that much time and that many courts and would go all the way to the Supreme Court? I don't think anybody uh, at that time anticipated it would take that long, go to that many courts, and certainly not to the Supreme Court. I think, uh, I think most people thought that this was a case that would be decided in Florida by the Florida Supreme Court under Florida law. Uh, that's the way uh, elections had always been decided. Um, uh, before. We'd only had one time uh, in our history uh, where you'd had participation by Supreme Court justices, and that wasn't even as a court. That was as part of a panel that included um, three people from the Supreme Court, three people from the House of Representatives, and three people from the United States Senate. So they, although they were justices, they weren't acting in a judicial capacity. So you'd never had the Supreme Court as a federal judicial body. Uh, deciding who became president of the United States. What was at stake in that case? Well, a lot of Other than the leader of the free world. Yeah, I mean, the leader of the free world was at stake, and, and that was a pretty important decision, and, and maybe a more important decision than we realized at the time. Uh, I think that, in addition, what was at stake was uh, the way our democracy works, um, whether you're going to have uh, judicial intervention um, to uh, stop a vote count. Remember what happened here was that under Florida law, people are entitled to a recount in a close election. And what happened here is the Supreme Court, five to four, stopped that um, recount. And indeed stopped the recount even before they'd had argument. They then had an argument and confirmed it. But they stopped the recount even before they had argument uh, on the case. Uh, and one of the things that the majority judges said was we want to stop the recount because if the recount shows uh, that Vice President Gore is the winner, then that will undermine the legitimacy of uh, George Bush's presidency, uh, which obviously was true. But I think some people would argue that that um, decision, in a long run sense, also undermined the legitimacy of the electoral process. I know lawyers don't like to lose cases, but can you, can you please describe to us what it is like to lose a case like that? Well, um, there probably will be no other like that. Uh, the, um, uh, there was, um, there was I, I had a birthday celebration not too long afterwards, and um, one of the toasts uh, remarked that uh, every lawyer uh, loses cases, um, but I had the distinction of losing the whole country. <laughs> Do no you feel likes, that burden? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think you always uh, wonder whether there was something else you could have done. Um, I think one of the things that has helped is some of the books and articles that have been written that interviewed the judicial clerks and the like um, make clear that this was something that the, the court had decided um, even before the argument. Um, I think. So the argument didn't make any difference? Um, you always hope an argument will make a difference. You always hope that you can break through um, and I, I, you always wonder whether there was something that you could have said that could have broken through that uh, perception, uh, gotten them to change their mind, gotten one judge to change their mind. Uh, but I haven't been able to think of what that would have been uh, that we didn't say. I, I've read that you and Ted Olson, who were on different sides of um the Bush versus Gore case, as opposed to being on the same side in the marriage equality case, don't talk about this that much. Well, we talk about it some, but uh, there's not much to say. 
And um, we could repeat what we said in court, but there's not much uh, productivity in that, particularly after the fact. The United States Supreme Court decided who was right. And, and that's the way we decide cases in this country. Um, you asked me about the significance of it. Um, I think there are some negative significances to that case, but I think there was a positive significance too. Um, and after the, after the case was over, um, I was interviewed by a number of reporters from around the world. I, I was interviewed by a particular reporter um, from uh, Russia. And um, that reporter said, you've got to help me understand this case a little bit better. It's very hard for me to explain to people in my country what happened here. I, where is your Yeltsin, he said. Where is your person who is prepared to stand on the tank and to say this is wrong and to call the people out? And I said, well, one thing about our country is that we have such confidence in our democracy that we know that no matter who wins this election, there's going to be another election in two to four years. And that election is not going to be affected by who won this election. This is not going to be a situation where the person comes in and does a coup, manipulates the electoral process. There's going to be a fair election four years from now. And if we lost this one, we have a chance to win it back next time. And because we have that confidence in our democracy, we are able to let the courts decide under a rule of law who, who decides. Because when you think about it, the courts are the only place that you can go to get a decision. I disagree. Well, I was going to say, and so plenty, plenty of people did disagree. And what do you tell those people who say, well, the, the courts weren't fair? Well, what, what you have to tell them is that somebody has to make a decision. And if, the, if I'd won Bush v. Gore, there would have been a lot of people on the other side that said, that's not fair. I understand, but it wasn't just your Russian friend who had questions sure. about whether or not this country was operating in a, in a fair yeah. way. And, and it's interesting to hear your, your description of that. Um, and it, what's, what's important is not that you be convinced that it's fair. What's important is that you be convinced that this is the best way to decide disputes, that it's better to decide them through our court system than to decide them on the streets. We'll be right back. We're back with David Boys. What advice do you have for, for young lawyers coming up in the business? Get lucky. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, you, uh, you, you look back in a, a career such as I've had, and uh, the opportunity to handle these cases is something that you could not have predicted and you could not have controlled. Um, a lawyer has to take advantage of the opportunities he's given. And one thing I'll say on my behalf is that I've worked hard and I've taken advantage of these opportunities. But you don't get these opportunities uh, by, particularly the first opportunity, by hard work. You get a good part by luck. I mean, the very first high profile case I did was a, a very, very large antitrust case that I tried in California. Uh, at the large, time, the largest private antitrust case in history. Um, I was the fourth choice for that case. Um, the other three turned it down. If, if, if any one of those three had taken it, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. A, a lot's been made about your dyslexia. Do you, how do you think that's affected your, your work? Well, it's an ironic way. Um, I think it's actually helped me uh, because the skills that I developed to adapt to the fact that it's hard to read are skills that I think have helped me as a lawyer. I mean, for example, uh, I was in high school debate. And um, in high school debates, you have these note cards. Uh, because of my dyslexia, it was very, very difficult for me to actually use note cards because it took me so long to locate it and look down. There'd be so much pause and dead time. It totally destroyed the effectiveness of the argument. So I had to learn to talk extemporaneously without notes. And that's been an enormous advantage in talking to juries and, to some extent, to judges. Uh, because it allows you to be much more conversational, allows you to be much more relaxed, much more natural. So I think it's a more effective way of communicating. 
And that is a consequence of dyslexia. And I would not wish dyslexia on anybody. Um, but uh, what it demonstrates is that dyslexia is not a disability. It's a difference. And you can adapt to that difference. And you can succeed with that difference. And sometimes succeed even more because of the difference than you could have without it. Pleasure to get to talk to you. It's great to talk to you. Thanks.